Hey guys, I'm back again, and my left eye is much better this time. No need to don sunglasses anymore, at least until I get back to filming outside. But enough beating about the bush, here's what this video is all about. So I wanted to do something a little bit different, subject wise. It will still be about motorsport, but it will specifically be about a form of motorsport which very often, unfairly in my view, gets dismissed as being just drivers, quote, driving round and round in circles. I'm talking of course about NASCAR. Now even amongst those who dismiss it as being just a sport where you drive around in circles, the sport does still have its big names. Even over here in Europe, they've heard of people like Richard Petty, Dale Earnhardt, and more recently Jimmy Johnson. But while the, tw the 2020 COVID-19 lockdown started in March of 2020, at the time of filming, one name appeared of which very few people outside of the USA have ever heard of. He was a driver who did things his way. A driver who formed his own team and against all the odds came from behind and won what many NASCAR fans will regard as one of, one of, if not the best, championship battle in NASCAR history. I'm talking about the man who came out on top of the six-way fight for the 1992 NASCAR championship, NASCAR Cup championship, Alan Kowicki. Now, I've got your curiosity going, haven't I? Who was Alan Kowicki? Well, from a NASCAR perspective, he was significant, obviously, hence why I'm doing a video about him. Um, he was a driver who, contrary to NASCAR's reputation of being born and anchored in the deep south of the USA, he was actually born not just outside the south, but in but way north in the in the Midwest in the state of Wisconsin, Greenfield, Wisconsin was his hometown, and he he was also a college graduate, a university graduate, as we would call it, in this neck of the woods, and more than that. He owned his own team. When he entered the top division of NASCAR in the 80s, he drove for Bill Terry. But when Bill Terry wanted to back out of the sport and sell his team, Allen decided to, rather than move on to elsewhere, because he felt anchored in that team, felt established, he purchased the team outright running it almost by himself with only two full-time employees and volunteers from elsewhere. He wasn't just driving the car, he was also the crew chief and also responsible for setting the car up. Being an engineer, who was to argue with him? Over the years Starting in 1988, when he got his first win, Alan Kowicki's team was gaining more and more respect. But that's not to say that it was easy. Because being an owner driver, you have to not just drive the car, but you have to be responsible for your employees' paychecks as well. And also ensure the team's general survival. When it came to sponsorship, 
he was all he was always seemingly up against it. He had an antifreeze company, Xurex, sponsoring him up until 1990. And during this time he was approached by one of, if not the most respected car owner in NASCAR at the time, Junior Johnson. Twice, in fact. And it, to use a Formula One example, it would be like approaching, being approached as a driver by Mercedes today. And he said no. And the second time of which, it was because he thought he had nailed down a sponsorship deal with the coffee company Maxwell House. Only to find later that Maxwell House was instead agreeing terms with Junior Johnson, sponsoring his number 22 car. And now we come to the restaurant chain in America called Hooters, based in Atlanta, Georgia. In the spring race at Atlanta in 1991, they approached Alan Kowicki on a one race deal, that's hard to say, <laughs> and sponsored him. He started from pole position and finished eighth. Not too bad by NASCAR standards. So much so that they agreed terms, signing on a napkin, no less. I don't know why I'm doing it that big. <laughs> and um, agreed terms not just for the rest of 1991, but 1992 as well. Which resulted in Alan running his number seven Ford Thunderbird in a white and orange paint scheme, which came to be loved. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, I know. However, going into that 1992 season, bearing in mind Alan had only won th three races in his, in his years since 1986 when he entered the top division of NASCAR. Only three wins, right? He, did, he got it into his mind that 1992 was going to be the year he'd fight for the championship. However, that doesn't mean everybody agreed with him. People would have been sceptical of his ability to fight for the championship. With good reason. His best championship standing going into 1992 was 8th in 1990. But outside of those years, he was hovering just about inside the top 15 in standings. Certainly consistent, don't get me wrong, but not necessarily championship contenders going into that season. But through a combination of picking up the pieces where he could and relentless consistency, Alan Kowicki pulled off the unthinkable and in doing so he beat five other drivers Davey Allison, Bill Elliott, Kyle Petty, um, <clears throat> Harry Gant and Mark Martin to win the biggest prize in NASCAR in 1992. And you'll notice, by the way, none of those names are Dale Earnhardt. Side note, he had one, probably one of the worst years of his whole NASCAR career, finishing only 12th in the standings. So yeah, Alan Kowicki won the NASCAR championship by just 10 points in 1992. Sadly, he didn't have long to enjoy his year as reigning champion in 1993 because on April the 1st that year he died in an aeroplane accident outside Bristol, Tennessee. 
he was just 38 years old. Now you're bound to be wondering why I'm talking about a guy who only won five races in total in his whole NASCAR career and is otherwise to outsiders to the USA anyway a mere footnote in the shadow of the likes of Richard Petty, Dale Earnhardt and Jimmy Johnson. But Alan Kowicki did leave his mark. For example, it became a bit of a unofficial tradition for drivers when they score victories in the top division of NASCAR to once they've crossed the line to stop their car, turn around and drive the opposite way around the track, backwards. I mean, they're driving round the track forwards, but the opposite way round to how they raced, if you follow me. And that came to be known as a Polish victory lap, in deference to Alan Kowicki being of Polish descent. <clears throat> and also, Alan Kowicki's success in 1992, incidentally being the first for an owner driver since the great, the King Richard Petty won the top division of NASCAR in 1979 as an owner driver. So yeah, Kawiki was the first owner driver since Richard Petty to win the title. And it sparked a resurgence, you could say, of owner drivers in NASCAR. The last owner driver to win in NASCAR was Tony Stewart. Yeah, it took me till the 2020 COVID-19 lockdown to discover Alan Kowicki. Um, to, to me, he's, his is an inspiring story of someone achieving things against the odds. Indeed, for that final round in 1992, with the Ford Motor Company's blessing, he nicknamed, he changed the name of his car, which normally said Thunderbird on it, to Underbird, in reference to his underdog storyline. I hope you found that interesting, guys. I certainly found it fascinating when I was reading up on it during lockdown. And, uh, I'll see you soon.